Well, welcome back, guys. And yet again, we're in lockdown, so I'm really sorry that you can't be with me in the classroom. Uh, but we'll still do some physics teaching. And as ever, I do hope you and your family are keeping well during this difficult time. So what we're going to look at today is capacitance and capacitors. It's an important A-level uh, topic. And I'm going to start off with describing how a capacitor is made, and then we're going to look at how it behaves electrically. OK, so um, let's look at the device that we would actually call a capacitor, something that has capacitance. OK, and capacitance is the ability to store charge. OK, so um, a water bottle or something has the ability to store water. It has a capacity. And this electrical device, the capacitor, has the ability to store charge. It's slightly different in the, in the case of a water bottle. Once you reach the top, it's full. In the case of a capacitor, you can actually keep putting more and more and more charge onto it until it gets damaged. But, you know, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. OK. But you can see where the word capacitance and capacity uh, came from. OK. So let's have a look at a physical capacitor. What actually makes up a capacitor? So um, this is an electrical device that's used in um, electronic circuits. And uh, its primary role um, is to store and release charge. Now, if you've been in my classroom um, at the front, where I've always got this circuit board sitting there um, just because I want people to take an interest in things. And it's bristling with electrical components. I can see transformers. I can see resistors. I can see inductors. And I can also see capacitors. And there are at least two different types of capacitor here. These um, sort of can-shaped large ones. And there are also some little tiny flat disc-shaped ones as well. So let's have a look at the construction of a capacitor. So a capacitor is basically two metal plates separated by an insulator. And that insulator can be air, it can be a vacuum. Uh, though normally it's a material of some kind that's insulating. So I'm going to draw a capacitor now. So here's a metal plate. And we're going to connect that to a wire. And here's another metal plate. I'll draw it a little bit like that. OK. And that's also connected to a wire. OK, normally they'd be the same um, surface area each. But what I'm trying to show you there with my terrible 3D diagram is two metal plates separated by an insulator in the gap. OK, so we've got metal plates. And in between them here, we've got air. Uh, in the case of two just held on um, stands, or it could be something like paper. Um, it can be um, oil, it can be uh, paper soaked in oil, and it can even be a material called mica, which is like a very thin piece of rock crystal. Okay, something that doesn't conduct electricity well. Okay, we call that the dielectric. So uh, that's how we put a capacitor together. And as you can tell from my drawing, um, it's quite tricky to draw that time and time again. So the circuit symbol, the actual symbol for a capacitor, is that. OK, be very careful not to muddle that up with um, a cell. OK, there are your two parallel plates. And uh, thankfully for me, uh, they're not drawn as a kind of three-dimensional diagram. OK, so um, in the real world, um, this is a very small capacitor, uh, and I'll hold it up. Uh, you probably can't even see it. But basically, it's a wire on the back of a metal plate. Uh, then there's some material in the gap. Uh, the dielectric, and then there's another metal plate in front with another wire connected to it. So that fella there 
Okay, if I was to sort of bend the legs a little bit like that. Okay, there we go. Um, and it's all been covered in a uh, potting compound in a kind of uh, paint or something that's non-conducting to hold the two plates together uh, at a fixed separation and to stop other materials getting in there. The trouble is, those parallel plates are very, very small indeed. So let's see if we can make um, a bigger capacitor. Now, this is where my um, drawing stick skills um, really tend to fall apart. Okay, uh, what we do is we take a large piece of metal, okay, a large metal plate and another large metal plate and we kind of roll them up. We Swiss roll them together. So I've started the process there of rolling it up to make sure that it's more compact, it's easier to carry around as it were, it's easier to put in electrical circuits. The problem you'll see of course is the two metal plates uh, will short out, okay? Um, and obviously this is uh, yet again a sort of three-dimensional um, system. So I'll just do that and I'll do that and bring that around there, okay? Uh, again, sorry, not very well drawn. I think this should really come a little bit closer. That's better. Okay. I can still do a better job of that, but never mind. Okay. Um, rusty teaching, having been on holiday all this time. So, um, let's put the dielectric in so the plates don't short. So, we're going to need to put some dielectric in here. Okay. And we're also going to need to put some in here. And we're going to need to put some around here. You can sort of see where this is going. Again, it's not a brilliant diagram, but imagine your uh, sheet of metal uh, with a piece of paper in between another sheet of metal, insulated top and bottom, and then roll it up. And all you then need to do is connect wires to the uh, sheet, that the top sheet. So have a wire coming out from the sheet that's the top sheet and another wire coming out from the sheet that's the bottom sheet, either on the same side or on the opposite side. Okay, so uh, we've taken large metal plates to make a bigger capacitance, rolled them up and uh, we'll end up with something that will be in a case that looks like this and if you take the leads out at the end, there we go. There's our sort of Swiss roll capacitor. Um, so other capacitors, here we go. Here's a, a, a bigger value of capacitance, okay. Uh, have uh, the material rolled up and they have the wires coming out of either end. So that's why on my circuit board, you could see little small flat plate capacitors, that's those. And you could see these larger can shapes, which are the ones where larger plate areas um, are rolled up. So, um, if you've got a bit of time now, I'd like you to just pause the video and go to the link that I'm going to put on the top of the video because uh, what's there is one of my FJ's Physics YouTube videos and we look at making a very large capacitor out of big long sheets of kitchen foil and then putting quite a high voltage on it. And I think you'll find that interesting and without uh, spoiling the story, um, the other thing that happens is I do that situation where I told you I try to put more and more and more charge onto the capacitor until there's a point where the capacitor can't cope. So if you've got a moment, um, have a look at that video and then come back to this one. If not, let's crack on with capacitors in use. So now let's look at capacitors in use. And what I mean by that is let's connect them to a power supply and see what happens when we connect them. And they're really very unusual devices. So um, our circuit is gonna look something like this. We're gonna take a source of EMF, in other words, a power supply or a battery. Okay, there it is. And we're gonna connect our capacitor to it via an ammeter. Here's our capacitor. So look at the difference in the circuit symbol between that and the cell. 
And just for the sake of interest, I'm going to put another ammeter here. You might go, well, what's the point of that? And I quite understand. And then there's a switch to allow us to turn the circuit on. But it's also interesting to uh, measure the uh, voltage across the capacitor, which, if it's discharged, will currently be zero. So I'm going to put a voltmeter across the capacitor. OK, quick reminder, the ammeters, the wires have no resistance at all. The voltmeter has an infinite resistance and the battery or a cell up there we can consider to have zero resistance, zero internal resistance. So we're kind of looking at the capacitor itself. OK, now, uh, if you've not seen these things before, um, your thoughts when we turn it on will be quite interesting. What you should say to me is, as you turn that on, FJ, the ammeters will read zero at all times because we have not got a circuit. And the reason we haven't got a circuit is the dielectric or air gap in here is non-conducting. OK, and in fact, you're wrong. Um, there's a very, very weird bit of physics that goes on to explain why we do get a current in this circuit. Um, and it's something called the displacement current um, in this gap. I'm not going to deal with that. That's more a university thing. But um, from now on, just follow what I'm doing because it's um, standard A level. OK, so um, what we're going to do is turn this circuit on and see what happens to the voltmeter and the uh, two ammeters. OK, so um, I'm going to redraw the circuit. Here it is. And I'm going to just get my uh, current wires coming like this. I've left out the ammeters. And I'm just going straight to the battery uh, or the cell. And I've now turned on. OK, now this is a very interesting device. It's time dependent. So like this. The plates were uh, neutral and uncharged. And as soon as we flick the switch, OK, this is the way I'd like you to imagine it. I'd like you to imagine that the negative part of the battery has an excess of electrons. It's a negative region and any electron there that's a conduction electron will be repelled and it'll end up here. That's as far as they can go. OK, but don't forget the positive of the battery is a place that really likes electrons. So here, any electrons that are on this plate uh, um, that can freely move, some of them will be pulled to the positive of the battery. That's what batteries do. OK, so here are positive charges. Now, what I'd like you to think of to keep this simple is that uh, the electrons uh, that have come off here have been pumped, pushed by the battery onto this plate. So they've made this negative and they've made this positive. And the, region, the reason the two have the same but opposite charges on them is that you can imagine that these electrons have come from here. So you'll always get uh, equal amounts of charge but opposite in sign. OK, now it's here you've got to be a little bit careful because the electrons have gone that way. OK, but remember that conventional current flow is always uh, from plus to minus. It's always the direction you could imagine a positive charge moving. OK, so this is the current. OK, now um, we need to look at whether this goes on forever or whether there's um, some time dependence here. But uh, before we do, just have a think about what's happened. So we had a potential difference up here and that drove um, or uh, pulled, you can imagine, electrons off this plate and pushed them onto that one. But if that happens, this voltage was zero to begin with and that voltage will go up and up and up as we get a bigger potential difference across the capacitor. But here's the clever bit. If the voltage is building up across the capacitor, it's going to build up until it's the same size as the voltage across the uh, battery. In other words, the battery's EMF, 
And then this is not very good physics, it's hand waving, but you can imagine the battery trying to pump electrons around the circuit, but the capacitor saying, ah, oh, but hang on, I'm going to push them back the other way because I'm charged as well, if you see what I mean. Or at least I've got a potential difference across me that's the important bit. So you'll get to a point where an electron is trying to get on, but these electrons are trying to push it back off again. So it will reach an equilibrium where no electrons get put on and none get taken off, so the current will drop to zero. So it is a time-dependent device and very odd in its behaviour indeed. Okay, so what have we got here? Well, we've got separation of charge and uh, electrons have gone onto uh, this plate here and they will be an amount of charge that's negative. Okay, minus the sign of the charge Q. Clearly on the other side we've got where they came from so this will be an amount of charge and it's positive. Now it's here that students get a bit confused. How much charge is on this capacitor? Okay, what value of charge do we use in equations? Well if you look at it, it's Q plus minus Q, so it's zero, which doesn't help us. Okay, but I'd like you to not to think of this as some charge and this as some more charge. That's not what's happened. Okay, this is plus Q because this amount of charge, these electrons have moved to there. So the charge on this capacitor is just Q, it's not 2Q, if you see what I mean. Okay, now there's another way of explaining that. We talk about the amount of charge that has moved from one plate to the other one. And the amount of charge that moved here is Q, not 2Q. Okay, but you'll notice that overall, of course, Yep, the charge on the system is zero. We've just separated charge. And to do that, okay, we've created a potential difference here. So we've needed the battery to do that. Once no current flows, once the current goes to zero, which um, if the voltage across here is the same as across the battery, then I will be zero. So um, it's important to say that when I equals zero. In other words, we could say the capacitor's charged. It's not fully charged. This is quite complicated. It's fully charged for that voltage, but if we upped the voltage, we'd push more electrons on, and so we put more charge on it. Okay, so I don't like the term fully charged. I prefer you to say um, it's fully charged for the voltage of the power supply that's providing um, the sort of electromotive force to drive the electrons on. Okay, so you do have to wait for it to fully charge, uh, but it's not, a, it's not a particularly good term. I'd much rather say, what is the charge on the capacitor after a period of time? And in this case, we really don't have to wait that long. Okay, so when the current's zero, we'll have a voltage across the capacitor. You can see that the voltage here will be the same as across the power supply. And what's really interesting is the voltage across the capacitor will be equal to the EMF of the power supply. Okay, um, It's quite an interesting situation. You might remember internal resistance and stuff like that. When you draw no current, which we don't once this is fully charged up, okay, then the terminal PD is always equal to the EMF of the power supply. Um, and that's what's happening here. Okay, I'll put a couple more letters on. This is uh, V, the battery, okay, and um, when no current flows, that's also the EMF of the battery, okay. We've got um, some charge here stored, okay, charge measured in coulombs, quantity of charge Q. We've got a current I, we've got a voltage V, and this has the ability to store charge, so it has capacitance C, okay, in farads, not to be confused with C for charge. Okay, let's see now um, how we can get a formula for capacitance uh, by looking at how a capacitor charges up. So you remember that uh, we'll look at the simple circuit, 
where we have our capacitor attached to a cell or a power supply. There it is. Okay, and at this stage, um, we won't go into how long does it take these charges to shuffle around so the EMF of the battery becomes equal to the voltage across the capacitor. Um, it's very quick, in fact, in the circuit that I've drawn. Okay, we'll look at that later. It's a bit more complex. So we've got charge separated. So let's have some positive charge there. And um, let's have our negative charge here. Always the same amount compared to the positive. Okay, and um, we'll leave this on for a few moments so it settles down. So the current in these two wires becomes zero because the battery's kind of pushing one way and the capacitor's pushing the other way. You've got two pluses forcing against each other. So you can imagine current trying to go that way and also trying to go that way. And because the potential differences are identical, there's no charge flow. So that's a static situation now. Thank heavens, so that makes the maths a bit easier. Okay, so um, let's take some uh, letters. Let's use some letters to um, define various quantities that we've got here. So we've got um, the voltage on the capacitor. So I'll do that in here, V, the voltage on the capacitor. And that voltage on the capacitor is going to be exactly the same as the uh, voltage across the battery so V this V is going to be equal to the EMF of the battery okay uh, the next thing is that um, on our capacitor you'll notice here or on the other plate we've got some charge we've got a quantity of charge and the current is absolutely nothing so let's see if we can make sense of this uh, mathematically and it's not actually quite as difficult um, as it looks. Okay, so um, as you turn up the voltage, so as you make the voltage bigger and bigger and bigger, you're capable of pushing more charge onto the capacitor. And it's a linear relationship. So the charge Q stored on the capacitor is proportional to the voltage um, across the capacitor, but also the, um, the voltage of the power supply, okay? Which suggests that Q, the quantity of charge, is equal to some constant times by the voltage. Yeah, you can imagine um, drawing a graph here and finding a gradient. And it's that constant that's really interesting. That constant is the capacitance. Notice it's a large C. Okay, the capacitance. And uh, this capacitance here, this is the capacitance, and it's measured in farads. Slightly strange word, farads, um, but yeah, Michael Faraday, of course, capital F. Okay, so um, the capacitance of a capacitor is a fixed value. Can I make that really clear? So when you get it out of the box, okay, and you go looking for the, for the capacitance, you can connect uh, any voltage on it you like until internally you get sparks, okay? Um, this one will go up to 25 volts, but the capacitance is fixed, okay? Um, and you can sort of see why the capacitance is fixed. Because if we rearrange this formula, yeah, so if we do C for C, C is Q over V, okay? So the capacitance is the charge stored per unit potential difference, okay? Now, um, think about what that actually means. It means that for a capacitor, you can put any voltage on it you like, okay? Any voltage you like before it breaks down, but the capacitance is the amount of charge it would store per unit volt. Now, if we're in farads, okay, it's, uh, we can use units now. The capacitance is the number of coulombs stored per volt, okay? I need to be a bit more precise in my language now. Capacitance is de defined as the charge stored per unit potential difference, whatever units you measure that in, 
Okay, but if we're measuring this in farads, it is the number of coulombs stored per volt. Okay, and um, it's interesting to um, look at what sort of values capacitors have. Uh, but before we do, let me just remind you that in SI units, yeah, this is charge, and it's in coulombs. So your number here, really annoyingly, your number will end with a C, okay, which confuses everyone because you must not confuse that with uh, capacitance. Yeah, uh, this is the capacitance. And that will be in farads, and I can just put a capital F there because uh, we know about this. And you know that this is the potential difference. So this is the PD, and that will be in volts okay so um, what sort of values do capacitors have can they store coulombs of charge okay and I mean like one two three four five coulombs well that is a vast amount of charge and it's a very 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 large number of electrons you know sort of 10 to the 18 electrons in a coulomb so um, the capacitors that we have even with uh, plates that are quite large in surface area rolled up um, store very very small amounts of charge per volt you put on them. And the typical values um, are sort of very low indeed. Uh, when you buy capacitors, yeah, you might find that um, you're getting uh, these little ones here, yeah, are in the uh, pico or nanofarad range. So the small ones might be sort of uh, 10 pico farads. Uh, the slightly larger ones, these electrolytic capacitors, um, large plate area, and a slightly different dielectric, uh, they might be in the range of, say, um, 200 microfarads. Okay, so these are sort of typical values. Now, I mention that because um, capacitors in the laboratory that we might work with might store only tiny, tiny amounts of charge per volt we put on them. So this electrolytic capacitor is only storing 200 times 10 to the minus 6 coulombs for every volt you put on it. So it's not storing very much charge. It's storing an awful lot of electrons, but not very much charge. My final reason for mentioning that is don't miss these guys. Okay, do not think that this is 10 farads and this is 200 farads. OK, um, these will always have these very, very um, small number multipliers in them. And you need to take that in account uh, when you're doing any mathematical calculations. Oh, sorry, I forgot to say, uh, typical me, um, that uh, making a point about how capacitance values are normally very, very low. Here's the Earth. And that's like a large plate that we can put electrons on. You know, we get lightning um, striking the ground and, um, you know, we rub materials and uh, earth ourselves. The capacitance of the earth is approximately 0 0.0007 farads. That's 0 0.7 millifarads. So even the earth with its very large kind of plate area... Um, it's a single plate, I'd like you to imagine it's a single plate for, for now. It still has a very, very low capacitance, um, but it's just an interesting number. And occasionally, um, I've seen, so at university, you, you use this in um, calculations. So now let's do an example using Q equals CV. We'll just do a quick, simple calculation. So um, I'll do the usual and uh, draw a capacitor circuit. So uh, here's our power supply and here's our capacitor. Now you guys are really good at this now. You don't need me to draw um, meters on this and you don't necessarily need me to say, we've left it on for a few moments. Charges have all traveled around this circuit and balanced out. So the amount of charge uh, here creates a potential difference across this, the same as the battery. So the battery pushes on, the capacitor pushes off, and it reaches equilibrium. So the current is zero. But I'll put some values on. So we'll make this a 10 volt power supply or battery. 
and we'll give this a typical value. Do you remember there were sl small values? 200 microfarads, okay. Uh, that would be typical of an electrolytic capacitor, one of these fellas. Um, just as an aside, I know I go off on them. Um, because a capacitor is made of two parallel metal plates, it doesn't matter which way round you connect it. Okay, they're not like diodes or anything like that. You can connect them either way around, which is why these flat plate capacitors uh, don't have a sort of marked leg on them, a plus and a minus leg. Just because nothing's ever so simple. Okay, electrolytic capacitors are exactly the same design, but there's an electrolyte in here, which is the dielectric, and the dielectric only likes to be pulled one direction. So these do have a positive and a negative terminal. So if ever you build them in circuits, and at school you definitely would build circuits with me, um, the crimped end, okay, with the uh, insulator in, is always the positive part, so you must connect that to the positive of the battery, and the open metal uh, end is always the negative, you must connect that to the negative of the battery. If you turn it around, um, basically it doesn't work, it's to do with the dielectric, okay? If you turn it around and put it in too high a voltage, it explodes on you, so, hmm. And there are, um, YouTube's covered with people who've got plenty of time on their hands to do that sort of thing. Um, the other way you can tell is uh, it's often written on it. Uh, there's an arrow and it, the arrow always points to the minus wire. So this one has got an arrow pointing that way. I just mentioned that if you um, build these in a circuit because, let me just grab this one. Okay, there's an electrolytic. Now we've got the crimped end here that makes life a bit difficult because two wires coming out but there's a big black side here with minuses on, so that's the negative leg. It's always shorter as well. Enough of that, this is not an electronics building lesson. So, um, there's our little circuit. How much charge is gonna be stored on this capacitor? Okay, so Q is equal to C V. Yeah, the charge stored, once you've let it settle down, that's really important, you must let the current reach zero, okay? Q equals C, which is 200, and I've done that on purpose, okay? It is not 200. Do not forget the micro, okay? That's why we had to do all that stuff on prefixes. Uh, 200, oh, I've got a YouTube video on that as well, but that was last year's work. 200 times 10 to the minus six times by 10, which is the voltage, so the charge stored, um, I, you could do it a number of ways. You could put the extra zero on here and then um, multiply by um, 10 to the minus six, but the charge stored is gonna be two, uh, I'll put 2.0, make it clear, times 10 to the minus three coulombs, okay? Uh, two milli coulombs, two milli coulombs, okay. Um, I suppose you could write it like that. Two milli coulombs, okay. Again, just an aside, those of you who know me well, I'm pretty obsessive about engineering notation. I find it much easier to understand. I find it, 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 it does have problems with significant figures and things, I appreciate that. But you see, you know, writing that down, um, as two times 10 to the minus four farads, yeah, you know, sort of uh, whatever. Um, it's just so much easier to quote in uh, micro, pico, milli, if you sort of mean. That's, that, you know, that's kind of what's written on the can of a capacitor and will be written on a circuit diagram. So I quite like these powers of 10 in, you know, minus three, minus six, minus nine, minus 12, etc. Anyway, that's just me. But it allows me to do that, doesn't it? Which is quite, quite nice though. Here we haven't got any numbers on that side of the decimal other than the two. Right, um, how many electrons is this? So when this is fully charged for that voltage, um, by the way, if we put 20 volts on here, it would be fully charged with uh, 20 volts, twice the voltage, uh, twice the amount of charge. So you can see why I'm not very happy with the term fully charged. It's fully charged for the voltage that you're using. Right, this one's charged up 10 volts. 200 microfarads, how many electrons go on it when it's fully charged, when the current's naught? Okay, well, this is a large number of coulombs, 
So how many individual electron charges are in that number? Okay, so um, the way I sort of do it is I say, look, the number of electrons, I'll just do N sub E, is equal to how much charge we've got. Okay, divided by how much charge is on an individual electron. 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. Okay, uh, now you'll notice I'm leaving the minus off here. It's, 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 it's kind of how many of them are there. Okay, um, and that comes out as 1.3 times 10 to the 16. It doesn't have any units because it's coulombs divided by coulombs. So it's 1.3 times 10 to the 16 electrons. Okay, um, you can sort of hint here at the quantum side of... Um, uh, it's a bit, not very good physics teaching this, but, you know, that's a hell of a lot of electrons, okay? It's a massive number of electrons, so we see this as a continuous process, more charge, more charge, more charge. But, of course, because the charge on an electron is so small that, um, you know, if you only had a very, 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 very small amount of charge, you could only put on one electron, or two, or three, or four, and you would notice the charge jumping up in steps. But, of course, in the quantum realm, once you're dealing with large amounts of, you kind of lose um, the, the, the graininess of the quantum uh, nature of things, that it's coming in individual chunks, and it's just continuous. I'm off on one now, aren't I? But, you know, don't think of an ammeter as the needle moving one notch, then another notch, then another. You know, you see it moving continually because we're dealing with very large amounts. And, you know, that's a lot of electrons, which shows us that an individual electron it's not only very, very small, but in fact, the charge on it is so microscopic, it doesn't really have any effect individually on the human scale. So I do hope you found that video useful on capacitors, an introduction to capacitors, uh, what they are and how they work, and using the formula Q equals CV. I'll be making another video uh, soon on capacitors in networks and what happens to the total capacitance of capacitors in parallel and in series. Anyway, I look forward to seeing you then.